three NHS leaders are taking part in our discussion. Artheta Daz is a consultant psychiatrist based in Derbyshire. She specialises in eating disorders and has several senior educational roles. And um, how do you start making those social connections, those human connections? For me, it's about self. You know. Cara Afzal is the programme development lead for health and implementation at the Greater Manchester Academic Health Science Network. It's all well and good going on training courses. She's responsible um, for leading large-scale transformational health and social care improvement across the Manchester conurbation. Attending lots of courses. Eddie Oller is the director of Nottinghamshire Health Informatics. His role includes pushing technological boundaries to improve health and social care. They're sharing their personal experiences around race, power, diversity and inclusion with NHS Leadership Academy faculty member John Deffenbaugh. Just been thinking about uh, my earlier days uh, in leadership when the opportunity arose within our local trust um, where there was difficulties with a certain division within the trust which was struggling and um, the medical director asked me to become involved in a local leadership program run for this division which would be multi-professional um, so including doctors, nurses, OT, psychologists, everybody who worked with them, the, sort of the senior uh, team that worked within that division uh, with the idea that bringing them all together um, to find sort of joint, a joint solution would be um, more empowering than having something thrust upon them. So I turned up to the first meeting and uh, as people were talking about all their ideas for development and things that they could do, um, feeling very enthused, I said, so how are we going to build in uh, the diversity and equality uh, agenda or how are we going to introduce that um, within the programme? And there was silence around the table um, because at that point I noticed that I was the only person from a uh, ethnic, ethnic minority um, and then the divisional director said what do you mean by that and I said well um, the patient population that we serve is very diverse ethnically but the uh, staff who are treating them there is a clear imbalance in the ethnicity and diversity of the staff who are treating them and I just wondered um, if we're thinking about patient care and leadership, how this might feel to the staff as well as to the patients, how we can start talking about that. And um, the answer was, we don't need to talk about that because that's not important uh, in leadership. At the time, I didn't know how to respond to it. Um, so I tried once again. I said, I, I think this is really important and if we are going to think about changing the culture within this team it is an issue we need to address mm. uh, maybe not head on but certainly um, think about it and at least have a conversation about it in this room right. if we don't necessarily take it to the yeah. program itself um, and again it was shut down and um, moved we just moved out right. on on from the agenda on to another agenda item about development it certainly gave me um, a very powerful demonstration of what it feels like to be excluded, yeah. but also kind of feelings of, left with feelings of guilt that actually I should have done more, mm -hmm. that I probably didn't fight my cor corner well enough, I didn't art articulate myself well enough, I should have kept on at it. There are other ways of approaching it rather than within that meeting, maybe I should have approached. but. It was very much sat with me. Yeah. I think that was my reflection, that all those feelings sat with me rather than actually people, other people in the room reflecting on what had just happened. It sounds so disempowering, I guess is a word going through my mind, is, is what you were probably feeling, not to put the word in your mouth, but was, was there anybody else in the room that, that kind of shared that or had any awareness of, of, uh, of the conversation of the, what you were trying to raise? I think they did because in one-to-one -one conversations later on people said oh I think you know I think you were right yeah. and again reflecting about the power within that room it wasn't just about race yeah. um, there was um, a male female um, I think there was something about gender mm -hmm. politics within that room yeah. and I think there was also something about age seniority and profession 
um, about the sort of clinical, non-clinical split. So I think there was all lots of subtleties. Um, uh, power plays are never, s yes. never kind of clear or clear cut. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I can put it just down to race at yeah. all. Yeah. The other emotion I was left with was surprise that um, I'm used to people uh, nodding when when things like that are said and saying, oh yes, it's very important, let's put it on the agenda and never, nev never discussing it. Um, and that's usually how things are dealt with but in the NHS by just kind of put it on agenda item 41, knowing that we'll never re <laughs> reach it. <laughs> so, um, but to actually shut it down completely, yeah. I wondered about um, how that can still happen, that it can be shut down and completely, and it can still happen. Yeah. Well, as, as, as you said, sometimes there's a, a no other dynamics, yeah. a power dynamic, and often in these circumstances, I, I, I find collusion. Yeah. You know, people just collude in that. Cara, your own yeah. experience. I sometimes, um, in terms of my experience, I'm a keen advocate of patient public involvement, mm -hmm. and I see some of the exclusions around the communities in general terms, not just around um, ethnicity and race within the boardroom. There is exclusion of discussion around the patient public involvement agenda, which is key really mm -hmm. to, to bring in a broader spectrum of views into the boardroom. And um, you find that, I, I don't know, I can't quite put my finger up, but it is quite challenging within the current NHS climate um, to be discussing these things because I think board members are struggling with how do we deal with these quite complex issues of dealing with the minority voice, um, be it race or social class, you know, how do we deal with that within, within the parameters of delivering this healthcare system which is running at a pace and we need to bring these changes in quickly. How do we do that? How do we marry that up? So sometimes it's easier to close down those conversations mm -hmm. because they're seen as difficult yeah. conversations. Yeah. However, from my perspective, what's needed is a broader spectrum of views within those boardrooms mm -hmm. where you are bringing these diverse views in because the solutions lie outside in those communities. What's your view on the, the type of leadership qualities that are required in the NHS to have the type of conversation which you would see as beneficial? My stories about power and class and culture aren't all negative. I've had some really positive, ex lots of positive experiences mm -hmm. and two of the most important mentors and role models in my career have been um, sort of white middle class males. So, mm -hmm. and um, they've been tremendously supportive, very empowering and um, my relationships with them have um, given, uh, uh, given me confidence but also opportunities which I would certainly not ha otherwise have had. Mm -hmm. The commonalities between sort of these influential people I would say it's about openness to experience mm -hmm. and bravery um, and there's all, all kinds of people that you'll meet in the NHS, but I think people who are open to new experiences and open to feedback which they may not right, right. Um, find comfortable, but they can sit with that discomfort. Can I take it already from what you've just said that, that you were able to give that feedback and I'm curious how that was received? I was able to give that feedback because I think importantly we had that relationship of trust mm -hmm. and when I gave the feedback the individuals receiving the feedback knew that it came from a place of kindness and compassion because we had that trusting relationship. Um, so I, I, I would say it's very difficult to have those conversations without establishing some kind of mutual trust and a safe space for that to happen in. I think when you talk about leadership skills in this context, I think the, the dynamics are changing of what a leader should be. There are no heroic re leaders required in this context. It's more of an inclusion, it's an approach. So the skills you need a, a, as a chief exec in, the, in this area is, for example, to be able to listen to people and understand the context of which they're offering their views, to try and be inclusive to them and also 
but also be courageous about the questions you have to ask yeah. because um, as, a, as a, and the word system leader comes into discussions quite a, a lot these days but it does require that that actually you, you can't rely on hierarchy anymore in order to make things happen mm -hmm. you need to understand what you're trying to achieve set a goal set a vision and um, what one thing that I would say is that actually the, the, the currency the things that uh, you operate within your organization are set by the chief executive mm -hmm. and it's really important that, that you recognize that so if you ignore some um, inappropriate behaviors, val values that right. don't actually operate or you yeah. don't feel are part of yeah. your, your yeah. value system, yeah. if you ignore them, then they're set, they set the tone of your yeah. organization. Yeah. So you do have to be courageous as a leader yeah. to challenge those and yeah. build a team that yeah. will challenge those as well. And they've got to have, as we talked about earlier, that, that whole awareness and self-awareness and That's recognize right. that. That's right. I recently heard the chief executive speak and he said, how can I understand what it's like being a black African woman, woman living in um, w one of the areas in London, you know, um, raising two kids in poverty, I can't, you know, um, who, you know, may be coming um, to, to, to use our healthcare system and I need to tap into the expertise of my diverse uh, members of staff to, to be able to understand that. Um, but I would go further and say that, you know, you need to attempt to understand mm. that by possibly, if you are, do live at a distance um, from um, your, your community that you serve, then in some way try and immerse yourself in those communities and understand those perspectives. Um, if the leadership um, al allow themselves to immerse themselves in those cultures and be, you know, be open to new experiences, then I think that will enhance their understanding. Yeah and help them in their, in their leadership role. Just to sum up the, the qualities that you all talked about, um, openness, um, we talked about bravery, being courageous, trust, listening, awareness, self-awareness, talked about being a system leader, um, talked about you know, have, having that radar screen on to be, have that self-awareness, talked about being on the shop floor, um, talked about knowing and almost being in the shoes when you were talking, Cara, I was, I was thinking, right, being in the shoes of the community, getting out there. Mm. So that, that's kind of summarizing the, the kind of key leadership qualities and attributes and approaches you talked about. So what, what, would, what would you like to see change from that briefly? I've certainly not sat on any chief exec appointment panels. Maybe they're different, um, and maybe you could tell me different, John. But um, I think, and from a very pragmatic point of view, chief exec appointment panels need to change, right. and how they how they appoint chief execs. Because if that's the, that's what they're saying that they value, right. how are they going to find a process which echoes that and mirrors that and produces a candidate which? De de uh, who demonstrates those attributes. I'd love to see a broader representation of perspectives at board level, including you know, patients at the board. We need a broader spectrum of views. Um, and until we get that broader spectrum of views, I don't think we're going to tackle some of the fundamental issues that we have at the moment in the NHS. So I think we need to be braver. The chief execs need to be braver and say, actually, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing a mirror image of myself. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, and how can I change yeah. that? Uh, Eddie, your, your final point in terms of what needs to change. We judge others by what they do, but judge ourselves by what we say. And I think that disconnect really does need to change because if we can't raise the self-awareness uh, within ourselves in order when we make those appointments as a leader or w we, we're thinking about what the dynamics or the diversity or the ethnicity or the um, um, gender um, balance needs to be for a board, we need to do that with an intelligent um, conversation mm -hmm. with the system, and what I mean by that, is, which is the, uh, the population that we serve and the organisations that serve those populations. And as soon as we can recognise how important that is, then I think we will start making an impact on uh, um, bringing on board the right talent, regardless of any protective characteristics, mm -hmm. in order to make a difference. Well, some key messages there, really strategic messages, which uh, we'll get on to uh, NHS England and uh, uh, the trusts and uh, NHS Improvement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.